Hi, this is Dr. Gary Siskin, and today I'm going to be lecturing on bronchial artery embolization. My plan for today's lecture is to start by giving an overview of hemoptysis. I'm then going to transition into discussing the bronchial arteries and including both their anatomy and their function within the body under normal circumstances. We'll then talk about where those two topics meet because that's going to lead us into a discussion of bronchial artery embolization. It's important first for us to define massive hemoptysis because those of us who perform bronchial artery embolization procedures are often asked to help people experiencing massive hemoptysis. And this is usually defined as a specific volume of blood within a specific period of time. But there are problems with that statement. First, approximating the amount of blood is challenging, which means that bleeding is either underestimated or overestimated. Secondly, the most common definition to use for massive hemoptysis is three to 600 milliliters per day. But prior definitions have varied widely from as low as 200 milliliters per day to 1,000 milliliters per day. And in fact, it may be better to look at other factors, such as the briskness of bleeding, the ability of a patient to maintain a patent airway and expectorate blood, the availability of therapeutic options, and the patient's underlying physiological reserve. And as a result, the bottom line is that any degree of hemoptysis causing clinical consequences, such as respiratory failure from airway obstruction or hypotension, is considered life-threatening hemoptysis. In these patients, the cause of death is not hemorrhagic shock. It's asphyxiation from an, an inability to oxygenate or ventilate because of hemorrhage flooding the airways. Keep in mind that the total volume of the conducting airways averages only 150 cc's. As you can see on this table, the differential diagnosis of hemoptysis is, um, is extensive. There is a mnemonic battle camp which can help remember help you remember the major causes of hemoptysis. This includes bronchitis and bronchiectasis, aspergilloma, tumor and tuberculosis, lung abscess and pulmonary emboli, coagulopathy, autoimmune disorders, AVMs, alveolar hemorrhage, mitral stenosis, and pneumonia. When you look worldwide, active TB is the leading cause of hemoptysis. But in the Western world, the most common causes include cancer, chronic inflammatory lung diseases due to bronchiectasis, and this includes things like cystic fibrosis, and aspergillomas occurring within a chronic sarcoid or TB cavity. As many as 25% of patients presenting with hemoptysis are considered cryptogenic because no cause can be found. These patients are first usually evaluated with imaging and a chest x-ray is often done to identify any acute changes in the lungs to localize a potential site of bleeding. But the site of bleeding is determined on chest x-ray in less than 50% of cases. And in fact, it may be normal in 20 to 30% of patients presenting with hemoptysis. It especially can be limited when a disease process involves both lungs and where there's aspiration of blood into both lungs in the setting of massive hemoptysis. CT is better at localizing the site of bleeding, and the rates can be as high as 63 to 100%. The yield can be even higher when combined with bronchoscopy. CT can be good at showing bronchial arteries that are greater than 2 millimeters in diameter. These should be considered abnormal on CT, and these patients can then be considered candidates for embolization. Here's an example of how CT can be helpful. On the left, is a coronal image showing ground glass opacification in the right middle lobe. On the coronal image from the angiographic phase, you can see a prominent bronchial artery arising at the level of the tracheal bifurcation. And this correlates well to what we saw on a bronchial artery angiogram in the midst of an embolization procedure. CTA can also be helpful in identifying ectopic bronchial arteries and non-bronchial systemic collaterals, which helps target selective catheterization efforts during embolization. 
Finally, a CTA can be helpful in identifying uncommon causes of hemoptysis, including pulmonary arterial sources such as Rasmussen's aneurysms. Patients with hemoptysis should first be treated with resuscitation and supportive measures such as monitoring of vital signs, oxygen, blood pressure control, and transfusions. Patients with mild hemoptysis can be treated with bed rest, postural drainage, and supportive measures for cough and infection. If the side of the bleeding is known, the patient can be placed into a decubitus position with the bleeding side down because this can prevent hemorrhage from flooding into other regions of lung. Patients with massive hemoptysis are often managed in an ICU setting due to early intubation. Bronchoscopy is often performed after hemoptysis has occurred, and there are several reasons for doing this. First off, it helps identify the anatomic site and site of bleeding. It can assess the nature of the bleeding source and the severity of bleeding. And importantly, samples can be collected for cytology, pathology, and microbiology, which will impact treatment. In addition, bronchoscopy enables several therapeutic interventions. If a bleeding site is not identified, the pulmonologist can directly instill ice saline or epinephrine into bleeding segments. Both can cause local vasoconstriction, but keep in mind that there are concerns about epinephrine use given the risk of coronary vasospasm and arrhythmia. Balloon tamponade can also be performed to isolate the bleeding into one segment or one lobe of the lung. If the bleeding site is identified, then local thermoablative therapies can be offered, such as electrocautery, argon plasma coagulation, or laser coagulation, because these can all cause hemostasis in proximal airways. In addition, substrates such as TXA can be used to promote hemostasis if the bleeding site is identified. Many feel that bronchoscopy should be considered complementary to CT. CT is better at identifying parenchymal and vascular abnormalities and is valuable when it comes to embolization planning, but bronchoscopy is better at diagnosing mucosal abnormalities and providing tissue samples and potential treatment options. Surgery is something that can be um, mentioned briefly in the context of this lecture. Many patients, or in fact most patients, are not candidates for surgery due to pre-existing comorbidities and poor respiratory reserve in the setting of massive hemoptysis. Mortality rates of up to 40% have been reported following emergency surgery, and this is due to the risk of bleeding, asphyxia, bronchopleural fistulas, and respiratory failure. As a result, embolization is often turned to in the management of these patients. But before talking about embolization, it makes sense to review bronchial artery anatomy because the hardest part of a bronchial artery embolization procedure is finding and catheterizing the bronchial arteries, which is why it's so important to understand the anatomy. On this slide, you can see one of the earliest known drawings of the bronchial arteries, and this is by Leonardo da Vinci, who was particularly interested in human anatomy. In 1652, the anatomist Dominici de Marchettis would write, the lungs possess arteries and veins, both from the pulmonary artery and to the pulmonary veins, which as we have said, permeate the lung. But one can observe two or three arteries, which originate in the aorta and propagate through the substance of the lung. When looking at the bronchial arteries, 64% of these are considered orthotopic. And these originate from the proximal descending thoracic aorta in between the superior end plate of T5 and the inferior end plate of T6. They tend to arise from the anterior or anteromedial surface of the aorta, which contrasts with the intercostal arteries that arise from the posterolateral lateral surface of the aorta. The remaining 36% of the bronchial arteries are ectopic. These provide an independent supply to a bronchial artery territory, and they occur, they occur in place of or parallel to orthotopic bronchial arteries. They originate from sites including the inferior aortic, aortic arch, the distal descending thoracic aorta, the subclavian artery, the brachiocephalic trunk, the thyrocervical trunk, periocardiophrenic arteries, and the internal mammary artery. No matter where they originate from, 
the bronchial arteries run along the posterior aspect of the main stem bronchi and subdivide along the tracheal bronchial tree down to the level of the terminal bronchioles. At the level of the terminal bronchioles, the arteries form a network of arterioles on the external surface of the airway, and this is called the peribronchial arterial plexus. Small perforating branches arising from this plexus traverse the bronchial wall and contribute to a submucosal plexus, which then divides into capillaries. The distal bronchial arteries also supply the vasa visorum of the pulmonary arteries and veins, and these branches contribute to anastomoses between the systemic and pulmonary circulation at the level of the respiratory bronchioles and alveoli. The venous drainage is also interesting to talk about. At an extraparenchymal position, the bronchial arteries supply the lower trachea down to the lobar bronchi, and this blood drains via true bronchial veins into the azagous vein, and this accounts for approximately two-thirds of the bronchial artery flow. Within the lung parenchyma, the bronchial vessels can anastomose with the pulmonary circulation, and therefore, blood coming from these bronchial arteries drains directly into the pulmonary veins, and this accounts for approximately one-third of the bronchial artery flow. The bronchial arteries have two functions. The primary function is to provide arterial supply to the supporting structures of the lungs, including the airways, the middle third of the esophagus, the diaphragmatic and mediastinal portions of the visceral pleura, the subcarinal lymph nodes, and the vasa visorum of the pulmonary arteries and veins. But these vessels also have a secondary function, and this is to provide an alternative route to the lungs for gas exchange. Under normal circumstances, the bronchial arteries generally don't participate in gas exchange and only account for 1% of cardiac output. But the bronchial arteries can serve as a secondary route for gas exchange due to those anastomoses between the bronchial and pulmonary arteries at the level of the alveoli and respiratory bronchioles. These connections can dilate in the event of pulmonary artery compromise so that more blood can be directed to the lungs. And if that occurs, flow to the bronchial arteries can increase up to 18 to 30 percent of cardiac output. This has the potential to recur in five different settings in which flow through the pulmonary arteries is compromised. This includes congenital pulmonary artery obstruction or anomalies, acquired intrinsic pulmonary artery obstruction, acquired extrinsic pulmonary artery obstruction, pulmonary hypertension, and acute or chronic inflammation. And the last one is generally what we focus on in the context of bronchial artery embolization. This secondary function means that there's increased blood flow through dilated bronchial arteries that are under systemic blood pressure and through dilated bronchopulmonary anastomoses. In addition, the conditions leading to this in the first place can erode the dilated blood vessels or can release angiogenic growth factors which promote neovascularity and recruitment of collateral supply from systemic vessels. All of this means that the dilated blood vessels are fragile and prone to rupture. And ultimately, this can lead to hemoptysis. So hemoptysis most commonly results from the effects that underlying conditions have on the bronchial arteries, which is why it's then important to talk about bronchial artery embolization. Selective bronchial artery catheterization and angiography in humans was originally described in 1964, and it was Remy who reported the first successful bronchial artery embolization 10 years later in the setting of massive hemoptysis. Bronchial artery embolization is now recognized as first-line management for bleeding control in patients with moderate to massive hemoptysis. It can also be used as a temporary measure in controlling bleeding in patients who otherwise might benefit from definitive surgery. It can also be a palliative measure in patients who can't undergo surgery due to the extent of disease, non-resectable tumor, poor pulmonary reserve, prior lobectomy, and other comorbid conditions. An embolization procedure typically starts with a thoracic aortogram. Abnormal bronchial arteries can be seen on the initial aortogram in many affected patients. 
aortography can also be helpful to detect non-bronchial systemic arteries that can supply parenchymal lesions. After the aortogram, we move to selective catheterization. And the first steps in catheterizing orthotopic bronchial arteries is understanding where to look and the possible anatomic variability. Remember that these vessels originate from the proximal descending thoracic aorta in between the superior end plate of T5 and the inferior end plate of T6. And geographically, this corresponds to the area where the left main stem bronchus crosses the descending thoracic aorta. In 1948, Caldwell was the first to describe the most common bronchial branching patterns based on a study of 150 adult cadavers, and his findings are still frequently referenced today. This is the original drawing from his 1948 paper, but it's a little bit easier to figure this stuff out on more recent drawings. There are four common types with an additional five other types that he identified in his paper. Type 1, which occurs in 40% of individuals, is a common trunk on the right between an intercostial and bronchial arteries, and then two left bronchial arteries. Type 2, which occurs in 21%, is a common trunk on the right and a single left bronchial artery. Type 3, which also occurs in about 20%, is a right common trunk, a second right bronchial artery, and then two left bronchial arteries. And finally, a type 4 pattern, which occurs in about 9%, is a right common trunk, then a second right bronchial artery, and finally a single left bronchial artery. So you can see that a right intercostal bronchial trunk is present in at least 90% of patients. It typically originates from the aorta and runs superiorly, giving rise to one or more intercostal arteries before abruptly turning inferiorly as the bronchial artery. And this table presents the last five of the types of bronchial arteries identified by Caldwell in his paper. The next step is to remember that ectopic bronchial arteries can be a source of bleeding in these patients. Remember that they can originate from the aortic arch or descending thoracic aorta, the brachiocephalic trunk, the subclavian artery and its branches, such as the thyrocervical trunk or internal mammary artery, and the pericardiophrenic arteries. Finally, non-bronchial systemic collaterals can develop in patients with the conditions that result in hemoptysis, and they may need to be selectively catheterized as well. They differ from ectopic bronchial arteries in that they enter the lung through the pleural or pulmonary ligament and don't typically run along the bronchi. When present, they commonly arise from intercostal arteries, the subclavian artery and its branches, the inferior phrenic arteries, and upper abdominal arteries. They tend to be seen when the underlying disease process involves the pleura and or chest wall, and the specific vessels involved depend on whether or not superior inferior aspects of the chest are involved. Here's a case involving a, um, a cavitary lesion near the right upper lobe, which is subsequently being fed by a non-bronchial systemic collateral arising from the thyrocervical trunk. When it comes to selective catheterization of the bronchial arteries, we tend to prefer a Michelson catheter because it's very stable within the aorta. A microcatheter should then be used to optimize the delivery of flow-directed embolic agents. It should be placed at least one to two centimeters beyond the origin of the bronchial artery so that the catheter is secure and the risk of reflux into the aorta or spinal artery is low. So when you're performing selective angiography, there are several things to look for. First, you're going to look for active extravasation. This is rarely seen on CT or conventional angiography. It's been reported to occur anywhere from 3 to 10% of the time. There are several other findings that are suggestive of bleeding. Most commonly, you're going to see tortuous, hypertrophied, bronchial, and non-bronchial systemic arteries. You may see abnormal parenchymal hypervascularity or an angiographic blush especially in association with underlying tumors. Other findings include bronchopulmonary shunting and aneurysms. The other thing to look for is spinal artery supply. It's important to look for this to avoid the potential risk of spinal cord ischemia. The artery of Adamkowitz, 
which is the largest medullary branch of the anterior spinal artery, supplies the lower two-thirds of the spinal cord and may arise from the intercostal branch of a right intercostal bronchial trunk in 5 to 10% of patients. On angiography, you're going to look for a hairpin turn and a midline caudal descent. In general, bronchial arteries that arise directly from the aorta do not provide direct spinal artery supply. You also need to look carefully for the presence of bronchial artery to pulmonary artery or vein shunts. When these are present, particles may cause small pulmonary or systemic emboli that can then have other manifestations. So if you see these shunts, larger particle sizes should be considered. And this is an example of a bronchial artery to pulmonary vein shunt. The goal of embolization in this setting is inflow occlusion. We want to lower the perfusion pressure to the fragile vessels within the inflammatory tissue, which will then reduce the likelihood of further bleeding. We want to treat all bronchial arteries to reduce the risk of recurrent bleeding. This should be performed as close as possible to the abnormal bronchopulmonary shunts to prevent their early reestablishment from non-bronchial systemic collaterals. We generally use a flow-directed embolic agent, such as PVA particles, microspheres, and gel foam. And these agents are normally selected due to the tortuosity of the bronchial arteries and the distal nature of the parenchyma being targeted. Particles and microspheres should be greater than 325 microns in size because we want to reduce the potential for bronchial, esophageal, and spinal cord ischemia. We consider using even larger particles, meaning particles greater than 500 microns, when shunts are visible. And we are generally looking for this type of endpoint where we see persistent flow in the main bronchial artery and its branches, but we don't see that abnormal parenchymal blush. Liquid agents were traditionally avoided to reduce the risk of distal embolization, tissue necrosis, and non-target embolization but recent reports have demonstrated safety and efficacy with both glue and onyx. And in fact, they may have a more durable effect than other agents. Coils are usually avoided because they create a more proximal occlusion which can lead to rapid collateral development and recurrent bleeding. And in fact, a proximal occlusion can preclude repeat treatment if hemoptysis recurs. They can, however, be used to protect a normal vascular territory from embolization, especially when embolizing non-bronchial systemic collaterals. You can see in this patient with left upper lobe pathology that the arterial supply was coming from the internal mammary artery. And we were concerned about embolizing the distal aspect of the internal mammary, so we embolized that with coils first, pulled back, and were then able to safely embolize the non-bronchial systemic collateral vessel supplying the abnormal parenchyma by using particles from a proximal position. After embolization, immediate clinical success, meaning bleeding control, can be achieved in 75 to 90 percent of patients. Patients with hemoptysis related to cancer or cystic fibrosis often experience higher than usual rates of mortality within 30 days of embolization. This could be as high as 15 to 30 percent. And this is related to the severity of disease that prompted the massive hemoptysis to occur, to occur in the first place. The long-term recurrence rates after embolization have ranged from 10 to 55 percent. This can occur for technical reasons, such as a failure to recognize, catheterize, and or embolize the bronchial arteries or non-bronchial systemic arteries, which is why knowledge of anatomy is so important. The target vessels can recanalize, and they can also be incompletely embolized. Recurrence can also be due to the underlying pathology and can occur in the setting of both inadequate treatment or progression of underlying disease, which can often occur in the setting of chronic TB, aspergilloma, or cancer. In addition, previously unseen arteries, hidden shunts, or the development of collaterals can all cause revascularization after embolization. In the event of recurrent hemoptysis after embolization, or if abnormal bronchial arteries or non-bronchial systemic collaterals are not seen, then pulmonary angiography is recommended because causes arising from the pulmonary circulation can be responsible for hemoptysis in 5% of cases.
pulmonary artery aneurysms in association with cavitary TB, otherwise known as Rasmussen's aneurysms, can be responsible for hemoptysis in this setting. These are false aneurysms of the pulmonary artery due to arterial erosion by chronic inflammation. They can also occur due to lung abscesses, brachygenic carcinoma, or invasive aspergillosis. Other pulmonary sources include septic emboli due to the development of pseudoaneurysms and pulmonary ABMs. After embolization, many patients will experience some chest pain due to non-target embolization of the posterior mediastinum. Others might experience dysphagia due to non-target embolization of esophageal branches. Malaise and low-grade fever can also be seen. All of these symptoms occur during the first week and are usually transient. We tend to worry most about spinal cord ischemia. Remember that a medullary artery to the anterior spinal artery can originate from intercostal arteries and from the intercostal portion of an intercostal bronchial trunk. Non-target embolization therefore has the potential to cause spinal infarction and transverse myelitis. Today, with careful technique, maintaining a favorable catheter position within the bronchial artery, and using particles or microspheres greater than 325 microns, this complication is much less common than it used to be when it was reported at 6%. It's now down to 1%, or less than 1%. Other complications are typically related to non-target embolization, and these include bronchial necrosis, a bronchoesophageal fistula, ischemic colitis, referred pain to the ipsilateral forehead in orbits, a posterior, posterior circulation cerebral and cerebellar infarct, which can occur due to bronchial pulmonary vein shunts or via collateral vessels between the bronchial and vertebral arteries. Transient cortical blindness has also been reported. And finally, patients can experience phrenic nerve injury and diaphragmatic paralysis. Again, all of these are very rare. In conclusion, bronchial artery embolization is a safe and effective treatment for patients suffering from massive hemoptysis, which has allowed it to evolve into first-line treatment for this complex patient population.